My impression was that after the election, there was a period where there was a degree of reflection and a kind of a critical rethink of how the uh, the BBC, the other broadcasters, and and the press had dealt with uh, Corbynism and the kind of political movements with which it's aligned, the way in which the coverage had um, had understood politics, and partly that was because they all had had an egg on their face because there, a lot of polling pointed to different outcomes. Um, people massively underestimated uh, the left of the Labour Party and and re really it looked like at that stage that the political journalists, the people who we, we looked to for expertise on politics didn't understand what was going on. Um, so that was obviously quite embarrassing for everybody involved and I think from my recollection there was a period where there was some sort of critical reflection and discussion as to what went wrong and how we might do things differently but that seemed to die down relatively quickly, I think. Um, after a few weeks, it was sort of back to business as usual. S similarly to what happened with um, with the referendum, you know, there was a sort of sense that we got things wrong, but but then justifications start to emerge, people stop talking about it, and yeah, back to business as, as usual. And then now, I think it was interesting time, you know, to think about are these institutions going to change? Are new voices going to get access? Are the editorial processes going to be revised? It's not completely clear um, whether there's been a process of change, but there's very little that I've seen to, to suggest that there's been any radical or substantive rethink. Now we've reached a point where, yeah, there's, there's certain attacks on independent media, which are coming from sort of key figures within um, the BBC and The Guardian. And really, I think the whole of the, the establishment media now seems to be talking with one voice. Now, in terms of the basis of Nick Robinson's critique, first of all, it, there definitely seems to be a sort of a pack mentality at work, where most establishment journalists are all agreeing that the independent media is a, a major problem, that it's undermining um, the capacity to do good journalism. Now, in terms of the arguments that are being made, if you look at these establishment journalists, uh, there's a problem with journalism, and that's the starting point, but it's never a discussion that begins with the major journalistic institutions in this country. It, it tends to start with a, a couple of things. So Nick Robinson says there's an issue with political polarisation. That was one element of his argument. And then he said uh, there's a problem with the alternative media. Now, the political polarisation, I mean, that... That much I think is true. Um, the problem with it though is it doesn't acknowledge why there's political polarization, right? What's going on in society? Why are people disaffected with the establishment? Why is that attracting people towards different alternatives? And 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 what so what first of all, there's a the question of what's driving that process. And I think you can make a good argument that institutions like the state of the press uh, and, and the broadcasters and the politics of those institutions has been part and parcel of um, a kind of discontent with the, the way that society is and the direction it's going in. Now secondly, the independent media and the argument that that's what's driving a kind of um, disaffection with the establishment organisations and this represents all kinds of problems for journalism. Again, it's, it's putting the horse before the cart because if, if you start from the point that, okay, the reason people don't believe the newspapers or the broadcasters anymore is because people are putting about the idea that they're untrustworthy. I mean, it just completely avoids the question of why people think that's convincing, right? Because the, uh, the reason why people accept um, these accounts of these institutions is because it rings true to them, because they feel like they're not, um, they're not doing what is expected of them, that they're not giving a fair and balanced account of what's going on in the world, or they're not speaking to the conditions that people find themselves in. The, the evidence is on their side. You know, there's, there's a huge amount of scholarly evidence on how the mainstream media, as it tends to get called, reports. Now, the press, I don't think anyone doubts that the, that the majority of the press is, is, is propagandistic and politically partisan. The, the BBC, um, there's a, again, there's a huge amount of literature on how the BBC reports. It tends to reflect powerful interests in society. It tends to reflect a very narrow um, sector of political opinion, and it tends to defer to state institutions and official politics and how it construes um, issues. Now, that at least should be the starting point for any sensible discussion as to what we need to do about journalism and how we need to reform these institutions. It's one of the ironies of this line that Nick Robinson's pushing, that a lot of the things that he accuses the alternative media for, or the independent media, 
are just things which the private press has been, you know, leading the charge on for, for decades, you know. Like fake news, there's a lot of anxiety about fake news at the moment. You know, like the, the newspapers like The Sun or The Daily Mail, like that, this, that's what they do. They do fake news. You know, that's more or less their business model. They're committed to it and they're actually they're quite explicit about it. Now, that's what just, I think, just kind of laughable about the, the debate in terms of, you know, attacking, attacking the canaries news values, you know, I mean, I think we could have a sensible, critical conversation about how um, independent media should report things about journalistic practices, about um, the, the sort of uh, funding models which we create and, and what kind of information and knowledge, if you like, that's producing. But to see the canary as somehow an outlier in the world of the British media just seems to me to be absurd. I mean, if the problem is inaccurate reporting or a particular or or fake news, as that particular um, article was called, then they would be talking about the the private press, you know, which is is um, is owned by billionaires. It very explicitly reflects those interests. And Nick Robinson doesn't didn't even mention um, the the sky bid uh, in in that article, and 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 that should be the starting point, right? But I think it would sort of seem rude for Nick Robinson to mention that. There's this kind of strange kind of, you know, professional solidarity that seems to exist between the BBC and, and the private press. And it's, it's bizarre in a way because also these have been the key institutions which have been waging a guerrilla war against the BBC. You know, they've been doing that relentlessly since really, you know, the 1980s. And that's, just, that's been ongoing and everybody knows it. I... Um, interviewed a very good journalist, Sarah O'Connell, for a podcast I, I co-present with Dan Hind called Media Democracy. And we spoke to her about the ways in which journalists are perceived by, particularly by low-income groups, you know, met with an enormous amount of hostility, which I think really took people back. She mentioned that she had a colleague who, who attended the Occupy protests from the BBC, and they expected to be you know, welcomed um, when they arrived to be able to go there and talk, you know, with ease of people about their concerns about, um, you know, banking, lack of democracy and all those kinds of issues which were being discussed. And actually, they were met with this enormous hostility from the Occupy movement. And I think that took them back. And we saw a real intensification of that recently. If you see how, how people in Grenfell responded to the media as not being you know, people who would now tell their stories, but people who hadn't shown any interest in their lives and saw them as part of the establishment correctly. Now, there are different elements to that. I think the fact that the BBC sees politics as going on in particular locations and, and, and basically directs its journalism and the routine working practices towards those institutions is part of it. So the fact that it does exist, political journalism exists in the Westminster bubble, you know, it's not particularly interested in local politics is not interested in many of the issues which are really um, the most central concerns for people, particularly um, if you're in a low income um, area or you're, um, if you're finding difficulties with like welfare, welfare recipients or you're on the sort of hard end of austerity. Those are not people who the BBC has shown an interest in. So part of that is because the BBC is just orientated towards official politics and um, part of it is about the sort of people who are recruited to the BBC, the sort of, um, the sort of uh, classes that they come from, the sort of social circles that they move in. So the BBC has very, recruit very elitist recruitment practices. They tend to draw people heavily from Oxbridge and they tend to come from private schools or at least the representation of people from private schools is hugely disproportionate. And the sorts of people who are their friends with and they spend their time with are just very far removed socially, if not geographically, from the kind of world that those people live in. And reporting has just not shown any interest in, um, in what's going on at the bottom of society, as it were. Um, it's tend to focus on, uh, on the action at the top and, and not, I should add, in a very critical way. You know, I think it's perfectly legitimate for us to, as for all for journalists and 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 for um, sociologists to be examining people at the top of society, but of course you need to do that critically, and and you can never really lose sight of what what the consequences of actions taken at the top are for people at the bottom, because that should be part of the story. You know, if the government is pushing for an austerity agenda, people need to know what the human consequences of that is, and I think the the media generally has done a very poor job of that, and I think. 
like anything, if you if something will start to not ring true to you, if you know what's going on in, in your community, if you know what's going on to, with like members of your family or your friends, and then you see things on the, on the BBC or in the newspapers or the other broadcasters, which is misrepresenting that, you know, you, you know that's not the story. That's what breeds um, mistrust, disaffection, right? Um, it's not that um, bad ideas about the media have been put, a, put about, it's that a whole sway of society either don't think, they don't see their voices represented, or insofar as they do appear, because the BBC does cover this stuff, they feel like it's being done in a way that's misrepresenting what's going on. It's not giving a fair portrayal. So I think that's what lies behind the hostility. And, it, and it's rooted in all kinds of routine journalistic um, practices, it's rooted in um, the sorts of people who work at the BBC and it's rooted in the BBC's relationship to the state and other institutions.